So like little eight-year-old Noah was like, ah, I'm obsessed with money. Well, I got my first job when I was 10. Oh, excuse me. 10-year-old Noah was no, like... Well, it took me a couple of years to figure out how to get a job because <laughs> I was eight. So Excuse me. <laughs> It's wow. not like that plentiful at that age. <laughs> well, what, I, what were you thinking? Like, what got you so obsessed? I think my parents didn't have a lot of it. And so, you know, that's a when your parents don't have a lot of something or, or you have a noticeable lack, I think that, you know, maybe makes you focus on it more than other things. And what I have come to understand just in, you know, I, I really think people, there's an expression, money makes the world go round. I think money is a proxy for options in some way. Money is a proxy for choices, and choices mean freedom to me. Welcome to Seriously Catherine, a self-confidence podcast for women who want to be taken seriously in the world of business. Here's your guest host. Hello, welcome to Seriously Catherine. I am your guest host, Noah Simons, co-founder and CEO of Goodbread, a new small business lending startup that I I'm working on to make access to capital easier and more equitable for small business owners everywhere. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. It's a lot of work. Yeah. (laughs) I'll tell you, launching a startup is no joke. Joining me today is Christine O'Donnell. She is actually the owner of the podcasting studio where we are sitting today. And she has generously offered to be interviewed and to help co-interview me so that we can have a really dynamic conversation about what it's like to start a business and how thinking about capital and access to capital has has informed her perspective and, and maybe made her a little bit fearful and maybe a little bit optimistic. And uh, so just explore kind of what it's like to start a business as a woman here in upstate New York. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I am scared to have this conversation, but I also think that having conversations that we're scared to have is exactly why we should have them. Yeah. Agreed. (laughs) Totally. Totally. (laughs) So let's do it. Let's run at it. Let's run straight for it. The hot take for today is that the Fed cut the interest rate by half a point this week. And I mean, who the hell cares, right? <laughs> what, what does that have to do with what anything? What does that mean? Yeah, right. For the average small business owner, well, what it means is that getting money is less expensive today than it was three days ago. If you want to go to get out a, you know, take a bank loan, it probably means also if you are in those high yield savings account um, with some of your savings, if you're so lucky to have those uh that none those numbers are not going to persist. This was the first interest rate cut by the Fed since 2020. Great. It you know making access to capital less expensive is going to be helpful for inflation. It's going to unlock some uh, pathways for capital to flow that have been constrained, um, particularly on the equity side. So less relevant probably for most small business owners, but for venture capital people who are trying to get venture capital. Um, it's been a frothy, challenging environment to raise equity capital. Why did they do it, do you think? I think that they are seeking, I think they're seeing more stability in the economy and are seeking to curb inflation. I think inflation has been, I mean, obviously it's been a big issue for literally every person who (laughs) spends money on anything. (laughs) So uh, I think curbing inflation and seeing more stability in the market in this post-pandemic resettling of of global supply chain and, and global the global economies and how they're they're interacting. At least that's my take on it. So today's serious business lesson is brought to you by the Palette community. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, I about business lessons that I think are important, I I thought about two things. One is my recent personal experience, which on Tuesday night, I gave a five-minute pitch um, at the Hudson Valley Venture Hub for my startup, Good Bread. And I had eight slides, and I needed to tell a story. And I ended up taking second place and out of 10 companies, and I, I won some prize money, which is going to fund our, it's going to op- help us open our loan account, which is super cool. But the business lesson that's baked in here is that storytelling is equally important as financial projections. When you're talking to a investor or a lender or someone for whom you from whom you want to procure capital for your business, you have to be able to explain why in ways that people understand and can connect to. And so 
becoming good and efficient at storytelling is often very difficult. What I have found is that a lot of founders and small business owners are in love with their products or in love with their services, not necessarily in love with the business that they're building around selling those products and services. And so there's a distinction that I'm making between what the way you do you story tell to your customers and the way you story tell to potential capital providers? When I'm thinking about this and when I'm coaching other other entrepreneurs, the story that you're telling to a capital provider is tied to the growth and success of the business, not the specific products and services. And so you want to spend a lot less time talking about the products and services and a lot more time about the trajectory of the business. One of my side gigs along the way was in strategic communication and working with big companies who have to look at their stakeholders and figure out how to talk to them. Yeah. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. And yeah. And so when it comes to human psychology and the things that people will remember from what you said, people remember 7% of what you say to them. But you increase that like ability for people to remember just by telling a story. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. like one of the top things that we would identify is like, what is a focus that you want to share? What is one of your key messages that you want to get out there? But let's tie an anecdote to it. Mm -hmm. Like what, and like, what's a story you can tell me about your personal lived experience where you have feelings and emotions Yeah, and you can then share a real story and yeah. And then boom. So yeah, I, that does make so much sense to me. Yeah. What's the story you shared? Oh, for my pitch? Mm-hmm. Well, I opened with, I'm a proud upstate New Yorker, and I grew up baking bread with my dad in our little cafe in Hudson, New York. We sold it for $1.50 a loaf in the 90s. And now I'm working with a totally different kind of bread. Money, obviously, <laughs> in case anybody missed that one. It's also known as capital. Yeah, capital. <laughs> uh and then the second story that I told was going to a bank in 2015 for my food waste recycling company and getting turned down for an equipment loan. So some real lived experience tied to, that has made me even more empathetic to the, the path for many, many small business owners. This topic around access to capital is something that is near and dear to my heart because you know, I think growing up, I was obsessed with money and obsessed with having it and how people get it and trying to understand it. And, and you know, then I've made it my life's work to try to answer those questions. So like little eight-year-old Noah was like, ah, I'm obsessed with money. Well, I got my first job when I was 10. Oh, excuse me. 10-year-old Noah was no, like... No, well, it took me a couple of years to figure out how to get a job because <laughs> I was eight. So Excuse me. <laughs> It's wow. not like that plentiful at that age. <laughs> well, what, I, what were you thinking? Like, what got you so obsessed? I think my parents didn't have a lot of it. And so, you know, that's a when your parents don't have a lot of something or or you have a noticeable lack, I think that, you know, maybe makes you focus on it more than other things. And what I have come to understand just in, you know, I, I really think people, there's an expression, money makes the world go round. I think money is a proxy for options in some way. Money is a proxy for choices and choices mean freedom to me. And so this kind of, I think money is a proxy for the, these core values that I really appreciate having of myself. And I want to empower other people to also have those things so that they can live their best lives. Because otherwise, what else are we doing on this planet? So if you're not making money, don't be on the planet? Oh no, no, no! Sorry, I think I think a little bit got lost. We got lost in translation there, Christine. Well, so my, my trajectory on my thinking about this mm-hmm. is that my life's work is empowering other people to live their best lives, and understanding money is one way that I could help people to do that if they are interested in pursuing entrepreneurship, small business ownership thinking about how to grow a business so that they could, you know, leave their job or stop working for the man or whatever it is that they're doing that they'd rather do something else. Money is often a piece of that, right? Like most small business owners need capital to grow their businesses. And that capital is hard to figure out how to come by. Um, And I would say that a lot of arguments 
in families sometimes revolve around money and whether there is enough to go around. And sometimes on the weekends, you spend so much time trying to catch up before the next week starts, just like doing all the things that need to get done so that you can work and try and make enough money to go to work again and over and over and over again. And sometimes that stops you from actually going out and doing things with your family, like spending time yeah. with your family and going on adventures or trips or just not worrying, like taking a breath to not worry and to feel safe for a second. Yeah. I think um, you're highlighting some very common experiences, particularly for people in America. And I feel really privileged that in addition to growing up with not a lot of money, which I do view as a privilege, I grew up in a family where my parents really didn't subscribe to keeping up with the Joneses. Now, if you ask my sister, or at least one of them, there's a very different perspective to have on this. I think you know some people might wish that we did keep up with the Joneses a little bit more. But, <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate the amount of freedom that I feel from being you know, not so caught up in do I have the the latest this or the most that or other, you know, certainly I, I think it is maybe human nature. I'm not sure about this, but maybe human nature, certainly American culture to believe that there isn't quite enough and to, to have this like just a little bit harder, just a little bit more, just a little, you know, of of really trying to to stay on this hamster wheel. And I just want to pause and give you permission to not do that. I wonder, like, what? Just ask yourself the question: What would it be like if you got off the hamster wheel and that you look around, you you look at what you have, you look at how full your life is with love and friendship and health and and wellness, and and just be there in that place of like abundance of you have enough. And yeah, you're going to get another client. You're going to lose a client. Your business is going to go up. Your business is going to go down, but through it all, you have enough. What do your kids need? What do you need? Like you need love, you need consistency, food, shelter, clothing, like that's it. Like those are the things you need need. Yeah. So, but I think we're getting off track. Those are like higher human aspirations, I think for Well, I, I yes, I just I guess for me, like of course I'm I'm like taking I'm taking this all very seriously. I'm you're speaking directly to my heart. So, I would say like things that when I think of like, what do I need to feel like I have enough money? And I am the oldest child. I am somebody who has constantly felt like it is my job to take care of everything and everyone. And it feels like for the majority of my life that everyone has counted on me. And there is no safety net. There is no like gift of money that's going to come and and help give me that pause like it feels like that's not existent and when i think about it i'm like how much money would that be like that i would be okay well like what bills do we have to pay like what what else do like do we owe if we had like money in a couple properties we might feel like we're bringing in like what is that called? Passive income. So it doesn't feel like we have to try so hard, but we do. It does feel like you have to get to a place where you have passive income opportunities so that you can just chill for a second. But even the passive income must be managed. Right. Is it really passive? So is it really passive? Exactly. And then on top of that, it's like all of the what ifs, like what if my like mom needs something tomorrow or what if Steve's mom or dad need like what if like all of a sudden... Like you just, I, I come from a place where all of the sudden, all of these things always happened. So there is no safety net. There is no, it's it's like to me, like thinking in abundance is like, there's always a way to get more money. Like if I have a tomorrow, there's another way, there's another opportunity for to, to build the safety net, yeah. but it's not necessarily built. It's not there and um, it's not comfortable. And it doesn't feel comfortable. But like on top of like providing for everyone in my family and like my in-laws and like all like my siblings and all of that, it's like 
but I also need to think about my retirement and Steve's retirement and my kids going to college. Like, when do I get off the hook for that? Probably never because my heart won't let me like, even though I want them to be like, you know, we got this. We don't need you, mom. But like, I do want them like I want even if they didn't need me, I would want to be their safety net. Yeah. Wow. It's putting a lot on my, a lot of pressure on myself. Yeah. Why? It's a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, why not? You're an older child. child, Yeah. It's it's a a thing. It's a thing. (laughs) It's a thing. I'm super curious about how you embraced entrepreneurship given your fear. It wasn't something I was looking for. I grew up like desperately curious about the world and humanity and just like all living things and like wanting to help them. I just, I feel like in my mind, I'm an unlikely CEO. Um, I remember sitting on my driveway, like at the end of the driveway and just sitting out with my, my legs out, like letting mosquitoes come to like suck my blood and just like watch them like fill up with my blood inside them and being like, Thanks to me, they're going to have babies. How old were you? I'm helping these mosquitoes, like seven, maybe, maybe 10. I don't know. I was young. Wow. But (laughs) like, I just like, I just was like, I'm helping. I am helping nature flourish. It's itchy. (laughs) That's that's a really intense memory. I know. I just remember like so many mosquitoes were on my legs and I really wanted to like slap them. But I was like, I couldn't. They needed the blood to keep living and have babies. It's it's like, it's so weird actually to say it out loud. But it's, it's so sweet. and so, (laughs) so empathetic for the world. Think, yes. And so I just, I began like thinking about how to serve the world as a young person. As a host (laughs) for parasites. (laughs) Mm. As a host for mosquitoes. Um, (laughs) I don't know. I just, I really enjoyed April O'Neil from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because like I was born in April and I had an O apostrophe in my name and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm probably supposed to have a job like her as a reporter. And then I found myself just like really interested in having conversations with other people. And so I've been a journalist for my most of my adult life. I, I just want to ask, has was being in journalism originally uh, a career that gave you d- that made you feel safe and secure from a financial standpoint? No, never. Did you ever consider not doing that and doing something else that would give you a well, more safe and secure path? I actually originally wanted to be a marine biologist, but you know, because of the animals. <laughs> And I was fascinated by the ocean. Um, but then I did a report on being a marine biologist and learned that they made like $40,000 a year. And I was like, I need to make more money than that. Like, can't have that be what's going on there. And I don't know why I thought you would be able to make more money as a journalist. <laughs> like, I don't know why I just like never really did that. Project research, <laughs> that research, but it was something that came really naturally to me, and I loved this idea of being on the sidelines of history, and like sh- I just loved history and the idea of documenting it. And what history is is just a collection of stories from people who aren't here anymore, and it's just so. Interest like people are just so interesting to me. And so I was fascinated by them and just found myself wanting to try and understand people more, especially because so many people thought so differently than I did. And that made me more curious about understanding them. And then I actually worked in news and the experience of working in TV news is vastly different than the image I had in my head. Um, and there's considerably more grief and t- trauma than I was expecting. And at first, I thought it might push me out of the industry. But then I got so good at it. Like I got really good at being there on the worst day of your life. I got really good at being the person to help you 
speak out into the microphone or into the camera like you were actually speaking to your lost loved one. Like it just it almost became this way that we could create something outside of ourselves that maybe the great beyond would see or hear. And and I was good at that. Yeah. To make a really long story, not longer, because I'm going there right now. I'm like, let me tell you about the mosquito time. Um, I, I, I was in TV news for about 10 years. And then I was kind of forced out because of a scandal. And I got fired and then went into a deep depression before being hired by... Um, a health and wellness marketing company to launch a well a wellness news platform for them digitally. And so I started doing that for them. And then like a month in, they decided to completely change our objective after I started working at that company. And it didn't feel right, but I also was pregnant. And so I was like, well there are bathrooms here. So in working in TV news, there's like not bathrooms mm, yeah, anywhere. I can see that would be You're just like, hi. Yeah, I know we're at a crime scene, but could I like bar your toilet? Is that cool? I know you don't know me, but like I'm on the news. I'm <laughs> you safe. should know me. Can I just like... <laughs> I'm locally famous. Can I just use your bathroom? <laughs> so, but, Awkward. Yeah. Or there's just like a lot of Starbucks bathrooms I would go in or Stewart's. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, thank God for um, Stewart's, right? Exactly. And, th- you know, you're working at all hours and and often not in safe places, covering fires, breathing in. Yeah, you're thing. pregnant. Yeah. You're not really looking so I was to like, go back You know, that. I might just stay here even though they're changing the uh, the position a bit. And eventually they decided to dissolve the part of the company that I was in. Um, they had planned on me being a part of that dissolution, but I moved up my maternity leave by one week kind of as a surprise to them. I had told them that I might do that. But anyway, so I got saved by the baby. They let go of everyone else. And then I decided not to take all of my maternity leave because because um I was scared that I wouldn't have money or a job. And so I went back to work early. They had me develop and launch a podcast for them. And then because things were going so well, the podcast I launched became one of the top podcasts in the wellness space worldwide in just four months. And that's awesome, right? I like did that while pumping in a closet and meeting all of my other like deliverables for my job at that company. And I got it. Everything was going so well that I was like, I think I can take the rest of my maternity leave because you only have your child's first year of life to take your take all of the maternity leave. So I planned to take the rest of it and set everything up. And when I came back from my maternity leave, they were like, hey, so so and so is now in charge of the podcast. You're no longer going to be on that. And like, we're going to have you work on these other things. And that's like, for me, it was like, why am I letting other people decide the trajectory of my life? Like, I am, I'm kind of at the point now where like, why not me? Why not I, why, why don't I try this and see if I can't make it happen for myself? And so I did. How long ago? Six years. Yeah. So what was your next step? You had this aha moment. You Mm -hmm. said, I'm not going to let other people control the trajectory of my life. Mm -hmm. What did you do next? I hired a business coach, actually two, because, you know, I really liked one. And then I like interviewed someone else and like, I liked him too. And I couldn't say no to the first one. So I I hired two business coaches. I did like the second one more than the first one. But I just, you know, was like, maybe... Double perspective. Yeah, like maybe I need both. Like, Mm -hmm. and I could afford both at the time because I was still at my job. I didn't leave it yet. Mm -hmm. So I hired these business coaches and they started to help me shift my way of thinking Mm -hmm. into like, how do I showcase myself as a valuable asset? and or build a business and what is the thing I'm the best at and how can that be a service or product to others? And and then it was like, how do you charge for that? And then there was a lot of not charging enough 
and yeah and then just right. kind of learning along the way yeah. yeah yeah wow so very smart to i think to find somebody to help guide you through that i feel like that's i didn't know maybe unusual yeah. i don't know really i, I, I oh. don't know i i would love to survey some other people who have um, started their entrepreneurial journey partway through a career and, and see if like hiring a coach is a thing. I think it's a great idea. I just knew that I didn't know how. Yeah. And somebody else does. Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure that there is someone else who can help me figure it out. And I don't even know where to start. To me, people who are business owners also had horns. Mm. Like I just mm. felt like you couldn't be a business owner that was successful without being evil. Like it felt like it was all in the same category. As as capital providers, as investors <laughs> and people yeah. who are trying to lend other people money or, or invest, uh, you know, in equity for other people. And we were talking about this earlier that, that you see them all as. Yeah, I just I just pictured like everybody who is successful at making money, like they are not the ones letting the mosquitoes suck their blood. Like mm. that's not them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's in that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not that I should have been. Like, because self value was not really there. Like, I had a pretty difficult childhood. <laughs> I I was picking up on that, but I what I wanted to hone in on on the mosquito story was just how like how generous, really generous and empathetic. Like you are in the core of who you are. And that should be celebrated. And you're right that often that is not equated with being a business owner or being a capital provider. But I am here to tell you that not all people are the same. <laughs> and if people, you know, are investors, or people are business owners, or people are are whatever they're doing. Like there, there's the full range, full spectrum of humanity underneath uh, those people. And some have more and some have less and and some are willing to bring that to their work more and some are less um i think part of what makes me a little bit unusual is that i have a high degree of uh, empathy and a high degree of humanity that is important i mean it to me it feels fundamental to why i'm building good bread at all um, because i want access to capital to be easier and more equitable for small business owners you talked a lot about um, at the beginning all the different things, all the different hats you wear, and and time is our most precious resource. So if you're spending your time trying to catch up on the weekends and stressing about not having enough so you can just go get more and get more and get more, you know, I think, um, again, it's like, I and I counsel myself on this too because, my gosh, and I, I'm, I'm busy. <laughs> but, but the being present in the moment where you are and appreciative of what you have in that moment and the, just the richness of your life, I think that gives you a certain freedom when you can have that pause and not feel quite so obsessed about money. And I, and so back to the business owner thing that to tie this out a little bit, business owners have so little time. They're trying to be everything to everybody, trying to wear all the hats. And so if I could make this piece of their life easier where they felt confident and trusting in a capital partner who understood their business and was helping them grow, that is a good service from my standpoint. I would, I mean, it sounds too good to be true. Well, I think the, I need software to scale it. I need, I need, the, I need, I couldn't have done this. I, and I wouldn't have pursued this until we have the technology layer that we have now yeah. because I'm one human. And so you can't, you know, one human is only, it has a limit to the scale um, in terms of knowing every business and, and being that, you know, very personal growth partner. But I believe uh, very strongly in the power of a couple things. Um, I think the power of technology, very strong and, and our ability to manipulate technology to serve our aims. I believe that, uh, that I mean, we are building a, a new way of underwriting at Goodbread. And I have a lot of confidence in the methodology and the, the hypotheses that we're going uh, and building this new system with. I, I believe in technology and I believe in the power of community and I believe in the power of people coming together. And my work with good bread is to pull the best parts of character-based lending that integrate community interaction 
and context for where the business and the business owner exist into a fully automated digital platform that's built on humanity. So that's the you know the very big aspirational goal for <laughs> what what I and my team are working on and our initial approach was to ask the question how could we feel confident what would give us confidence that a business owner would repay a loan and we went to the literature we went to the academic work that's been done how likely are people to repay loans how do we know and we did this large review of on two vectors actually of academic study one is around lending and and people's attitudes about taking loans and repaying them and the other is on aptitude for entrepreneurship and suitability for being a small business owner and and so uh, i worked with a scientist ron Raggi from the university of rochester uh, a, a deeply expert at designing assessments at reviewing reviewing what's been done designing new assessments to uh, to measure different things, and then going and, pro and and then actually validating those assessments. And so, we worked with him on uh, on that work to to stand up the sort of first leg of our underwriting process. So, when you when Good Bread launches, you will be able to go to our our app, and in the application process, you'll be asked to take this. Entrepreneurial Aptitude Assessment. We're still working on the name for it. But this assessment is, uh, we expect to be predictive in loan repayment. Does that make sense? Yeah. I just, I, I, I of course, am, am selfishly thinking about myself. And I'm like, I for sure would have, would have failed that at the beginning. I think that for me, six years later, I probably could pass it at this point. But Well, the question is like, do you think that the ends justify the means? How, on a scale of one to six, and I'll tell you why one to six, okay. on a scale of one to six, how ashamed do you feel if you make a late payment? How scared are you of getting sent to collections? Like these kinds of questions are the oh. kinds of questions that are in this assessment. Okay. Some of them you could probably figure out like what we want to hear, right? And mm -hmm. you're probably going to say, I'm terrified of going to collections. But there are other things that, that might not. <laughs> Do you feel shame? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel shame I just at me? woke up feeling ashamed. <laughs> oh. Are you Catholic? Yes. <laughs> I was raised Catholic. I'm sorry. That definitely didn't help. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I do love religion. It's a whole other, whole other set of conversations. Um, yes. So, you know, fear, shame, guilt, like these are really, really strong, powerful drivers for behavior. And, and with good bread, how do we tap into the carrot and the stick? How do we tap into understanding who you are from the beginning and getting to know you better over time? And giving you the op opportunity for us to get to know you a little bit, and then us to build a relationship together. So you know, take a small loan, start paying it back, start building the muscle and building the relationship, so that you know you're building confidence in yourself. We're building confidence. You're building confidence in us. You know, trust is a two-way street, and it's a long-term exercise. And so, when I think about the the nature of humans, and I and I think about what we seek to aspire and then how this capital layer comes in. I'm trying to build a system that accounts for all of those things. I think that I have been raised to feel more comfortable with the stick than the carrot. Oh, yeah. You were Catholic, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel like... I think we all know a lot of, well, many of us know a lot about the history of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I just, um, I think that understanding that there is a carrot mm. um, will be a helpful thing for entrepreneurs who are trying to understand if they will or won't meet your criteria, just knowing that there are two things that are that are going to be happening here when it comes to like having an accountability par like partner but also like this reward as well and i think that that is really valuable for entrepreneurs to know who are like way more familiar with the stick than the carrot yeah yeah no that's a, that's a great point and obviously there are a lot of sticks in the in the lending world i can imagine so i i would say that there would be like fears i think that failure is so important 
if you don't fail, you do not learn. And some of the worst lessons that I have learned come like have been thanks to this awful failure that I I put myself through. And so I guess a concern for me would be like, I'm probably not done failing, right? Like every time I grow, every time I make it to a new step in business, another failure comes. And it's not that I mean to, or like it's, it just happens. Like it's like you have to just brace and or prepare for it, but you also can't be afraid of it. Because if you are afraid to fail, you're not going to accomplish anything. You're going to get stagnant and stuck and like seek safety. But that is not going to push you out of like that's not you're not going to grow. grow. You're not going to grow. And so I guess I just like I hold those beliefs, but I would worry with a capital partner like, hey, truth be told, I'm probably not done making mistakes. Right. Is that still somebody you would want to invest in? Do you want to fail with me? Because it could happen, even though I might feel ashamed about it. I mean, I guarantee you, I will feel ashamed about it. <laughs> no, st- that's a, that's, yeah. I mean, it is the job of the capital provider to measure the amount of risk that they are comfortable taking. And of course, you know, building a, a startup for lending, my business is to not lose money. Right? My business yeah. is to get paid back, yeah, and to pay back investors and to to build a, a sustainable long term business. So there are going to be there are bounds around the risk, right? And there are bounds around, um, you know, how we think about that, what and what just what makes sense from. But so, so it, bounds is short for boundaries. There's boundaries around the risk. Yeah. Like, you know, you have to have a certain debt to income ratio. You have to you have to have a certain amount of capital available, money available on a monthly basis to repay a loan. You need to have evidence of that over time. So and you need to have a justifiable, understandable growth opportunity. Like those are the people that we're looking for. You've been in business a while. You you've proven that you can you're running a business, you have a growth opportunity. You need a pool of capital to fund that growth opportunity. And that growth opportunity isn't outsized compared to where you are today. So you could have a nice, you know, making, I don't know, $10,000 a month, kind of small, very small business. And and you're, you know, generating some income, generating, you're, you're living off that. And you have an opportunity to, you know, buy something or, or invest in something that could bring you to a million dollars a year in business from 120. That's a big jump. I would say the let's sort of walk before we run, right? Yep. Go from crawling to walking, walking to running. And so modulating the risk in in context with where you are and what what it means to walk from from crawling or what it means to start jogging from walking. Yeah. So that that's the I would say the non-financial way of of expressing how I think about the ideal clients for good bread. Yeah. Cool. So in your case, you have a podcasting <laughs> studio, right? Yeah. So, you know, is there a piece of equipment that you could buy for, you know, $20,000 that is going to level up what you can charge, what you can what you can sell to clients? Or is there a, you know, a marketing opportunity where, you know, if you spend X number of dollars, you could open up this whole new vector of revenue for you? Well, there's a couple different, like, I'll... I can share a little bit with you about the podcasting industry. Yeah. I had built up some savings, some like decent savings, and I did not accept money from anyone. I just kind of had a decent amount of money in my bank account. And I actually was hoping I never would have to spend it. Like I, uh, but there's like a couple things that you do need to buy, and it's a pretty low barrier to entry when it comes to podcasting. Mike's camera, like a lot of this stuff we already had because we were journalists and we just had already invested in these things. And I guess just didn't even think about it as a business expense. But there's not a lot of overhead with podcasting. And I started by it like in production, selling production packages to people who are interested in launching podcasts. And so I started with one. I had a, a a referral from the podcast that I had originally launched. And I also like had met this person that 
we had met and then I got a referral from Dr. G and we worked together to build her podcast called The BS We Feed Ourselves. So I went from producing the Dr. Gundry podcast, which is a health and wellness podcast, to then producing The BS We Fe- Feed Ourselves, which was also a health and wellness podcast, but more like like the food, like the food you're feeding yourself actually might be crap. Like the thoughts you're feeding yourself actually might be crap. Like what is the BS you are feeding yourself and how do we like debunk it so we're not feeding ourselves crap <laughs> like, mentally and physically. Um, and it, and so, so I went from producing that show to producing another show and I actually, it was just a time investment at first. Like I agreed to do it for free at first just to see if you could if i if i could and if like she liked it and wanted to do it like i didn't want to charge mm. because her because you didn't feel confident that- yeah and i was like i might i like this i don't know and so i just did it for free and um and i did it while i was still working at the marketing company just in my spare time like after hours and on the weekends and not to mention I had a newborn and well, not newborn, but one year old and it's just like all the things like yeah. that you get, you have. And then like I went from one production to another production and I just kind of kept saying yes to opportunities and for sure undercharging. And I eventually got myself to a place where I was like, oh, I'm going to make a course that'll help people because when I first launched a podcast, there was no courses and there wasn't even a podcast about podcasting yet. Like, yeah. And so I decided I was going to launch a podcast about podcasting and I was going to call it podcasting made easy. And, and I hired a graphic designer, my first big investment. And I saved that contract because I was like, I need to know what these contracts are so I can then send them to people. Um, I was like, what's work for hire? Oh, so I can like use this branding, like the logo and stuff. And he's not going to come after me for the IP. Like, I didn't even know what IP was. Yeah. Like There was all of these things that were brand new to me at 30 something years old. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I just like it was just stepping stones. And I went from producing to coaching. I had a huge surge during the pandemic because oh, I bet. there was just a lot going on during the pandemic. And I was offering a lot of free things and then also booking new people and and just I started producing podcasts like everywhere like there was just and I didn't even know how I was doing it because I, I had gotten pregnant with another child had that child wearing a mask in the hospital <laughs> while like pulling my my other child out of school because the pandemic and we were in Los Angeles and and also wildfires were a thing and it was just it was insanity. And my husband was an essential worker for the news. So I was just at home running my business, taking care of these children and just trying to do it all. And like totally like losing myself. Like I, I didn't, I, I was a shell of a human and I wasn't even sure how to keep on existing. Like I just was struggling so much because there was zero self-care happening. Um, And any self-care was like self-flagellation care. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, I'm doing this to care for myself. I'm doing this because you're not enough, Christine. You have to get on that bike because you're gross. So (laughs) it wasn't kind to myself. And so I just, it just was a real, like the pandemic was like a tough time, I think for everybody. Um, But But it was for us. That sounds especially hard. It was. Yeah, it sounds especially hard. Um, I also learned during that time that I wasn't somebody who could show up for everyone because I was doing a lot of coaching calls. And so I went from being a producer to being less of a producer and more of a coach and a consultant. And I was like, I can't because it, it's just so many meetings and like group meetings where you're showing up and doing a lot of webinars. And I just that wasn't a, it was a personality mismatch. Like I am it's a cons- different kind of energy. I'm considerably more introverted and I needed more bandwidth for myself than that. So how did you get out of that? I did you think about getting a job? 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I tried to quit being an entre- entrepreneur so many times. <laughs> that like, surprise me. I, and I tried to find something and it almost felt like finding another job was just as hard as being an entrepreneur. And also my mind had started to change. Like I started to think about jobs and entrepreneurship in a whole new way that I hadn't been before. And the idea of losing autonomy, like I just didn't want to. I didn't want to anymore. Why do you think autonomy is so important to you? Like, Why do you think that matters so much? Because I think... I think that not enough people deserve my love. I think that when I am hired, I will care so much about my job for you. I will do everything in my power. I will work myself to the bone for you. But most employers do not care. I was replaceable. I was I was just another replaceable person for them. And I just felt so discarded time and time again by employers when I was like, God, I loved you. Like I would have done anything for you. And you just like chewed me up and spit me out and then moved on to the next. And nothing I ever did was good enough. It felt like, and it just was like, and I don't know if this was my perception or the reality, but it just felt like nobody, like when I started looking at these people who I was working for, I'm like, why do you deserve this much love? Why do you deserve me caring so much? If I'm going to care this much and if I'm going to work this hard, it's got to build something for me and my family and my life. And I have to find a way to put me forward like first. And once I started doing that and started like actually finding success and like closing deals and all of a sudden people were valuing my services and appreciating me and it still takes me by surprise to this day. But I just am like, why didn't I put myself first for so long? Why did I feel like I had to be on the sidelines of history? Why couldn't I be a history maker? And and there was a switch that happened in my entrepreneurship journey where I was like, why not me? Why not? And I'm like, you don't, you guy don't deserve it. You guy didn't deserve it. <laughs> like you, right. you took yeah. it. You, you so, step up and you take it. And, and so I, I was for. It felt forced, <laughs> like, but I did. I finally just chose me, and it took a while. And I tried to give up on me if, quite a few times, and then. And then I don't know. That doesn't stick. So you you keep coming back to you. I did. I do keep. Well, I I mean, I'm really accountable. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, and just first off, thank you for sharing that. I feel like it's pretty intense to, I don't know, to know that about yourself and to share that about yourself. So it's real. Yeah. Well, it's real. (laughs) Um, And I think, you know, it's uh, also highly relatable content, I think, for many, many people. Oh. That's why I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I would love to hear just when you think about your business now, like, is there a growth trajectory? Yeah, there is. Yeah. How does the business grow? Well, there's a number of different revenue streams. Production has been the main thing that has um, really pushed us forward. But outside of production, Podcasting is still a new industry. And what we are seeing is the listenership of people who are curious about podcasts, want more podcasts, listening to podcasts is just on an upward trajectory. The data is there. And so so more people are going to want to listen to podcasts. People tend to want to watch things or listen to things when they want to. And they want it to be what they want, not what some person who is doing TV traffic decides is coming up next, right? right? Like people want to choose what they're watching and when they're watching. And then, and there are so many different niches that you can learn about and you can like the world is your oyster. Like I just, I don't think that that's going to be going away for people. In addition, there's the whole media buying perspective Purchasing an ad in a podcast is going to do more for your business than any other ad. 
Is that true? Yes, it is. 54% of people who listen to a podcast are likely to buy that thing that they heard about in the podcast rather than reading about it in a newspaper, seeing it on a billboard, hearing it on the radio, because they become so connected with the host. And the host is in their head Interesting. all the time. Mm-hmm. When they want, they choose. They chose their host. And when that host is like, you know what I'm doing? Mm. I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. Like I found this and it really works for me Mm -hmm. and my family and this thing that I'm doing. And then people are like, huh, well, I think I might look into that. Yeah. 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 Like if, and if this person who I know, like, and trust is doing that again and again and again, why am I not? Yeah. And there's still just so much room for growth because podcasting is a baby industry. So fascinating. um, so this is a new thing that we have started to explore at Bright Sighted is media buying mm-hmm. and sales because we can provide a return on investment for advertisers that all other advertising companies aren't yet mm-hmm. because they're sticking to traditional routes unless they're smart enough to like o- like open up their eyes to podcasting, which they should. Yeah. Like, they should. And I'm happy to work with those people. I think that there's more than enough yeah. room for growth for a lot of people and that is exciting also podcasters are really cool (laughs) every podcaster i meet is just interesting and curious and a little weird but in the weird that i like and like i just want to get to know them more and they seem to be really caring and i just feel like caring is cool these days so there (laughs) yeah Yeah. well listen you're totally you you said earlier you're totally a people person and that definitely comes through when you think about the growth of the business in these different channels, are there investments that you could make that would accelerate your growth? Yes. Yeah. So something that would be, is really important for productions is having an advertising budget to purchase ads to get their show in front of their target audiences. And I think that this is the one mistake that most independent podcasters make is not budgeting money for their own advertising and marketing. Every single podcast is like a mini business and you can make it sustainable for yourself. But you have to make sure that you're getting it in front of the people that want to hear it and see it. Like you just have to, sometimes it just, you have to put an investment to it. Just like any business has to invest in advertising and marketing. So do podcasters, but so many how do, just how aren't do thinking about that. podcasters make money from sponsorships? Some of them make money through sponsorships. Some of it's through selling their own goods. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they make money because they're sitting next to someone who they haven't had like a real in-depth conversation with before. And then they're like, why are we not working on this project together? Yeah. Like, yeah. like they have these like moments where there's like this... Synergy. Yeah, this synergy. The, the... And they find it in their like, like-minded like community. And they're like, I'm so glad that I took 45 minutes out of my day to have a real conversation with you and get to know you. And now, yeah, like, let's try this thing. Yeah, totally. So there's a lot of different ways. Um, media buying, it, like the top podcasters are making a lot of money out there. A lot of independent podcasters aren't making millions, but they are making like enough to pay for their podcast, Mm -hmm. I would say. Or like their podcast is just like a hobby and they're doing it for themselves and they have a different definition of success. Mm -hmm. And so some of sometimes that definition doesn't have anything to do with money. It just depends on the person. Yeah. Yeah, I'm mostly interested in the money side. Of I know, I know, I know you are. Um, <laughs> well, and and mostly interested, like from you, if you're thinking about this, you're, this is your podcasting business. Yeah, you are in the business of helping other people, either make a business out of podcasting or not mm-hmm. make podcasts for whatever reason. Are there things that you could invest in today? Another studio, a bigger studio, more staff a better e-commerce platform. Like, are there things that you yeah. could spend yeah. money on in? bright-sided productions that would move the needle for you from a revenue standpoint. Yeah, there are. You would sell more X if you had Y. Well, I, uh, so another revenue stream that we are currently exploring, and I kind of shared it with you, I think last time you were here, is just getting more people in these chairs. Mm -hmm. Like I love the idea of helping people create more content, but not gatekeeping 
the process. So to me, what that means is selling studio space so they can come in, create something with high quality equipment and audio, and then go off and do whatever they would like with it. Because a lot of people these days are really savvy when it comes to editing and social media, especially the younger generation. Thank you. Yeah. And so that we can... I think we just, we got to get the word out about it. And so, and we just haven't started yet because we just do one priority at a time. Otherwise we will get overwhelmed and just like not move. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I, yeah. I, I, I get that. Would, is there a scenario where you would say, you know what, I'm going to take a loan out so that I can invest in a ton of advertising so I could grow this particular line of business? Yeah. I mean, it'd be scary. And then I have to convince my husband, too. Oh, yeah. I don't know. So we get like, you know, it, it's really great yeah. that actually now, unlike within my lifetime, like 40 years mm -hmm. ago, uh, you don't actually need your husband to co-sign for that loan. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> and it's not about, it wouldn't be about no, I know, that. I know. It just I, would be about like. I'm just pointing out that women <laughs> and access to capital, it's been a real problem. Yes. And just within my lifetime, when people had to have their husband or their father co-sign for a bank loan. Yeah. Like women could yeah. not get a bank loan. Yeah. How crazy is that? It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's crazy. Or a mortgage. Like, right. Exactly. In some cases. No. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I, I know somebody who lives in this town who's one of the first women to get a mortgage without having a, a male, a man oh co-sign it. Her on the show. I, I know her. We could. We could. She runs a, a, a drapery business. Yeah. Yeah. She the sounds, eyebrows sounds... of your home. <laughs> She sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, fascinating. So, yes, obviously some psychological hurdles and some relationship yeah. hurdles <laughs> to take that kind of a risk. But yeah. I, I am working with you a little bit on an imagination exercise on, oh. on what would it be like if you were thinking about growing your business more strategically and less from a place of like, well, just more strategically. I think I'll leave it there. I think that would be awesome. I haven't sat down and had a conversation with anybody about that ever. I have had conversations. So I have a bookkeeper who we work with and he gives me some great financial advice and he is thoughtful and we think differently. And I really, I really like that. And so I, and, and there's just a lot of respect so like, I just, I, I really value his opinion. So before I were, were to like move forward with any of those things, I would just like be like, hey, like Joe, let's talk about what this would look like. And he constantly tries to get me to think strategically in ways where I'm like, like where there's no emotion. Like he just taught, like he, he just like sees it in his like, I guess, mind's eye. And for me, everything has emotion attached to it, which... Maybe might make sense to why I might have so many emails in my inbox. <laughs> <laughs> you can't let them go. <laughs> just can't. I'm a hoarder, in email hoarder. You're um, just attached. To this thing. <laughs> just attached to what if I need it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I think um, there's like a labeling and archiving function that lets yeah, you. Yeah. No one go taught me how to them. do that. So I feel that. <laughs> it's definitely self-taught. Feel like nobody ever taught me how to be like an email organized an organized email person yeah well i will tell you that i'm starting to pay someone to do that for me so wow yeah interesting yeah um so so yeah i think it would be something we would consider but i would want to just out of respect for the people who have helped me get this far include them in the conversation so that we can make the step again together and i'll be i'll be aware of the risks and what we need to be accountable for. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a it's really a thought exercise on on if you were to embrace strategic thinking, what could that look like? And maybe capital is a piece of that story. Maybe it's not, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, capital, like money, is a proxy for something that you need. Right? Yeah, like it, you don't necessarily just need money. You need you know new equipment. You need advertisements to go out somewhere. And so, you know, money is our our proxy for exchange with one another uh, to exchange goods and services through some shared sort of thing that we have that we've both ascribed a value to, but the money isn't valuable in and of itself, 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Which is, I think, a weird exercise to put people through. Do you have like emotional attachments to money or like spreadsheets? What do you mean emotional attachments to money or spreadsheets? Like when I picture someone with a lot of money, they have horns. Like, and so my emotional attachment is, and I almost feel like this was like because of society, right? Like the people who have the money wanting to keep the money, they made those TV shows that put the horns or like the duck mick. Scrooge what yeah. was that? remember him yeah, he's totally. like ah, and he's like kind of an asshole but yeah. like he has all this money like so many stories that yeah like that. like all of these stories that we watch as children where there's literally Sc- Scrooge like, like, like that's he's character. the literal character is Scrooge and he is mean mm-hmm. and rude and but doesn't he have a lot of money yeah yeah or like Kerrigan do you guys remember Casper? The ghost? Yeah, Casper, the friendly ghost. That that mo- that movie? Like Kerrigan was like so mean. Or like Cruella DeVille. Also mean. Right? Also very mean. I mean, literally so cruel is in her name. <laughs> exactly. And devil. Like and wealthy. And wealthy. And so I have been I I'm a product you've absorbed, of society. You've absorbed a lot of the popular yes, culture. Exactly. Like this is so. Of course, I'm going to picture this because it's what I've been fed. It was the BS that I was fed as a child, and now I like am st- like I'm st- it's I'm still working to get over it. Yeah, it's interesting because mm-hmm. I mean I think there are other examples from history where you know you you hear these scions of industry who, you know, Rockefeller, uh, Carnegie, all these, you know, people whose names are on buildings and cities and Hospitals. companies. They're right. helpful. Well, and philanthropists. Oh, well, so all of these people mm-hmm. who have been extremely wealthy and set up infrastructure and and assets for communities that that persist well beyond well well beyond their their lives, their, their individual lifespans. And so, I think Yes, popular culture aside, <laughs> there are some examples of mean rich people. There's some examples of nice rich people yeah. in popular culture, in actual history. And so I you, know that now. Yeah. But it's because I'm in a different fishbowl yeah. than the other fishbowls that I've been in. Mm-hmm. And I feel like you don't even know you're in a fishbowl until you're like hop into a new one and you're like, Whoa, did you know I was breathing water in there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. You, it's true. You you. It's very hard to to look objectively at where you are in the moment. Hindsight is twenty twenty, right? That's the thing. Yeah, I don't think I really ever understood that. <laughs> <laughs> Hindsight is twenty twenty, Christine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but you look like you don't. Agree. I just I don't know if I think like, it's just. You're, so what you're saying is like. What what does that mean? Hindsight is twenty twenty. Well, in your fishbowl analogy, you mm-hmm. you were I think indicating to me that you had some different perspective. Oh, on that the I bowl. didn't know that I was just right. breathing then, water, right. but, but now I you, you now you know you were breathing water, mm-hmm. so you have this much clearer vision of yourself when you look backwards. Yes. That's the hindsight. Twenty twenty. Thank thank you. Yeah, totally. Just hang it all together here. Appreciate it. You're really smart. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to follow the thread of the conversation. So the goal is to demystify access to capital for someone like me. Yeah. So what would you suggest? Take the mystery away. Well, I think it starts with where are you and what do you what do you need? Where what do you want? And I think of it more as a where do you want to go from here? And then how do you get there? And then how does capital come into play? I'll, I think for me, I'd have to get out my spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> it's just generally and a spreadsheet. I have to look at, at just, but, but you don't, yeah. I don't usually start with a spreadsheet on strategy. I usually start with like some ideation and, oh, okay. and a whiteboard. Oh, I love whiteboards. I got one out there. Yeah, see? Yeah. So I start with a whiteboard mm-hmm. and then I back into a spreadsheet or I, or I, it's whiteboard to spreadsheet and simple spreadsheet. Just like. Here you go. Yeah. Oh, I got, I got one. This is so exciting. So I like to think of Bright Sighted Studios as a place that's a lot like Dry Bar. Mm. Like you show up, you're the talent, you get your content and you go on your way. Just like at Dry Bar, you show up. You get your hair done, 
you get a coffee maybe, you watch a show, and you go on your way. Or like Orange Theory, you sign up, you go in, you do your workout, and you then you leave. But like each one of these things like has a standard process mm -hmm. where, where you, it's not necessarily the people in the studio who have made the process, mm. but like the process is bigger than the studio, mm -hmm. but it allows a lot of people to mm -hmm. come in, utilize mm. the products and services, and then leave and then have marketing content to do whatever they need to do with that day or beyond. And like we customize this for your website colors yeah. and customize that for other people's website colors. That's so interesting. So you're painting a vision of almost a franchise model. I mean, Orange yeah. Theory literally is. Blow, dry Bar is. Those are literal franchises. I know they are. Yeah. But I don't think that there's any kind of studio franchise that exists yet. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So a franchise content studio. Yeah. I love it. Why not? Well. But first we have to prove it. And I think the proof is here. Yeah. But. Yeah. I'm getting, I'm starting mm -hmm. to really understand what you see as possible. Yeah. I just, I think that need for content is not going away. I think that people want simple content that's trendy. I think the podcast look is a trendy look, whether you have a podcast or not. And there's a lot of people who want to produce and share their stories but it's too much of an investment to do all of the things for things to go wrong, yeah. right? And if we can like simplify things in the pre-production space so they can be the masters of the post-production. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You know what has been working really well for me here is that you're yeah. co-located with a, um, a co-working space with yeah. Palette Community. Yeah. And I just, when I think about the infrastructure required for what you're talking about, you know, tacking on to an existing co to existing co-working spaces everywhere. I don't know. Just thinking strategically about how you might because you don't actually, you don't actually space need very much a... space, right? This is like a ten by ten room. Mm -hmm. You just gotta make it feel like a womb. We're in a womb, <laughs> <laughs> not a room. <laughs> Sorry. <Dad. laughs> um, that's interesting. I'm gonna look yeah. at this video in a different way. Um, <laughs> um, so so is this your vision for what you want to do with Brightside? I think that it is the next step. I think that I need something that is scalable, mm -hmm. that's less expensive, mm -hmm. and is something more people can just access. Yeah. I think that making access to high quality content is really important. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people have amazing stories to share. And without sharing your story, how do you expect to sell your product? Yeah. People want to know, like, and trust you before they purchase something from you. Yeah. And more and more, right? Yeah. And, and people want authenticity. And the creator economy is real. Like, it's not going away. I don't think TikTok is going away yeah. because there's too much money at stake and there's too many brands who have found the power of people creating short form content to sell their products. Yeah. It's just, there's too, I just don't see why it would go away. The yeah. creator economy is real and there's too much money at stake for it to be gone. There's a, there's a really interesting opportunity that you're talking about that I think is much bigger than certainly than meets the eye and bright sided today. Well, I have really, really big ideas. I hear that. Really, I really hear that. Many leather bound books. <laughs> um, if you, when you think about that sort of big aspirational goal, do you have a like, okay, well, I want to build this thing at the end. My next, you know, my next step is X or my next yeah. five steps are X, Y, and Z and A and B. Well, I th yes, I do. I, I do have a, a plan. Um, and, and this woman who you just met out here is part of helping me actualize that plan. I need to put it together. I need to pitch it. I need to, I need proof of concept and then I need to replicate it. Yeah. And so once it starts and I can get really clear on how I want to pitch it to the world and yeah. also not have someone else copy it, <laughs> which I mean, like if someone might, it, what happens if they do? 
I know you're I just have to have a better podcast giving this idea <laughs> out. You might edit this part out. <laughs> um, I, it's just it, it, you asked me what's next, and I think that that is what's next. Not yeah. only do I want to produce more podcasts, I want to make it easier for more people to share their stories and get their own marketing content, so that they can continue to grow their businesses. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very noble, very aligned cause, actually, in terms of how I yes. think about good bread. Here's your Saratoga lifestyle segment brought to you by Saratoga Living After Hours. <laughs> hey, guys. So if you are curious about what do Saratogians, like real local people here in Saratoga, do after track season ends, then you're going to want to check out this week's after hours post on uh, Saratoga Living's uh, Substack because they go into detail about all of the plans for the future. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So for more information on that, head to the link in the show notes. I'm so delighted to have had this conversation today. Well, I'm glad I had the guts to share it with you. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on your show. <laughs> uh, this is actually technically not my show, but oh, I'm weird. <laughs> so delighted to be the guest host for <laughs> Catherine Hover's Palette Community Show, mm -hmm. Catherine Hover's Seriously Catherine podcast. Yeah. Sponsored by Palette. It's sponsored supported. by Good Bread right now. It's true. Sponsored mm -hmm. by Good Bread, but originated at Palette. Yes. That's fair to say. Well, thank you again. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to this podcast. And if you want to connect with me, slide into my DMs on Instagram. My handle is Katherine Hover. <laughs>